Good morning uh, to the overseas volunteers for Better India live hangout. We have people from uh, many countries watching. This is our fifth event in the series. It's about the Aryan invasion theory. So uh, before we get into the topic, we will uh, give you a brief introduction of overseas volunteers for Better India. So overseas volunteers for Better India. Uh, you guys can watch the slides. It's okay. Yes. Okay. So was uh, started like a couple of years back. Uh, we have several uh, efforts to help with uh, NRIs and Indians in India. Right now we have this campaign for people flying to India to help with all the voting related activities. So we are an a political organization. So India has actually had a lot of good glory and good history in the past. And uh, the aim of these series is actually to kindle the same enthusiasm and pride that people had in India earlier. So in 1700s, I don't know how many people know, but we accounted for almost one quarter of the world's GDP. And now we are down to 3 to 4 percent. We have a lot of poverty around 30 percent. And uh, the rupee has also gone down. So we, many foreign philosophers and writers have written nice things about India. For example, uh, this is an American philosopher, Will Durant, how he talks about the contribution of India, and also Mark Twain, about all the things that India offers. Unfortunately, after 60 years of independence, um, we have had so much poverty and a lot of struggle for just basic education, a lot of corruption. If you see, we've had... Uh, Almost the same party Congress ruling for so many years. Today, uh, in, in uh, other foreign journals, what they say is that this overall freedom to start and operate a business is very restricted. What that means is that for all the new people who are entering the workforce, we have to change this situation. Otherwise, they'll be idling the years. And we don't want to use the youth of India. The average age of India is very young. It's 27 years only. So this is a good time for us to make a change. So Shri Shri Ravi Shankar started Volunteers for Better India last year. And uh, we have uh, lots of projects. And the overseas NRIs have also want to help out. And so this overseas VBI was created. So our vision is to make India socially vibrant, economically advanced, culturally rooted, and politically aware. So this is a very uh, noble goal. We invite all the NRIs and people of Indian origin to join VBI and OVBI because we need to uh, stop the degradation of society. So volunteerism is, is of very essence right now. So we want to bring national issues to the forefront, inspire the citizens to take ownership of the country, and mobilize all the citizen volunteers to raise awareness. Right? OVBI is just like people like you and me. We have normal people like doctors, engineers, uh, housewives, students, you know, everyone is joining. So we have reached out to a lot of people around the world already. We have more work to do. So what are the projects that we do? So the VBI in India, they work in the areas of rural development, women's safety, creating community leaders, school of good governance, and encourage youth participation. For example, we had this project of fixing this river in Maharashtra. It was a Jal Jagruti Abhiyan project. And uh, the VBI people did it in less money than the government. So we did a lot of rainwater harvesting so that the river is not dry anymore. 
this is a very important project. So like that, there are thousand projects in various categories. This is another project in uh, Karnataka, Kumudwati River. Here you see the just the ordinary citizens helping out, and we're trying to do, uh, store the water. We work with the geologists, the government, in order to do this environment projects. So this is another side of VBI. Here, you know, and so VBI goes around the country, and whatever is the need of the hour, it tries to help out. So here you see that uh, we have these uh, martial arts training for uh, the women from all the you know the incidences that we've heard so far on the bottom left you see uh, you know this is uh, the youth leader going to villages for village empowerment the de addiction problem is very high in the villages so we need to uh, empower the the village folks and the women out there because the power of india is a lot in the villages it's not just in the metro areas so in delhi and all that we've had other projects similarly we have and here for this Uttarakhand, even the army has applauded the efforts of the volunteers. It's uh, it's it's very uh, inspiring what they have done. So these are some of the other projects we have. Now we have lakhs of volunteers in thousands, tens of thousands of villages, going and helping out. Um, so we have lots of other camps and all that. You can take a look at it later. So the main thing is how to educate people about the rights and responsibilities and create grassroots leaders. We have a lot of challenges in the elections. Uh, a lot of bad voters. Many people don't vote. So we are trying to help uh, the, uh, you know, the whole country and the Election Commission of India for people to exercise the democratic right. It's a civic duty to go and vote. So what we are doing is we are conducting. So there's this "I Vote for a Better India" campaign. This is one of the projects of VBI, and so they go and do these happiness surveys around the country right now, and asking people what do they don't like about the country? Are they going to vote? Do they want to volunteer? Are they registered to vote? So this is you know engaging with citizens one on one. Uh, so we have lots of volunteers. We also need a lot of help to do that. What can NRIs do in the city? So one is you can become a volunteer. <clears throat> you can enroll on the website. You can call your friends and family to vote and register if they can. And uh, you know create a network in whichever country and city you are in. We have OVBI in USA. We have it in Canada. We have you know in uh, in Europe. In, now in, in East Asia we are going there so if you want to start this is uh, you know we can help you so right now the scams are very high if you total uh, just the last three scams uh, you will find that they exceed the GDP this is not a way a country should be running so uh, we have you know problems at the border rise in rapes this genetically modified food doctors are saying if it comes to India these uh, the, the GMO seeds it may increase the cancer rates you know so we need to stop all that so be part of the change uh, already a lot of youth and you know and many adults have joined this uh, VBI and OVBI the way you can join is uh, you can sign up on OVBI um, and then there are a lot of inspiring videos here you can look at it and then you know your thousand dollars will reach thirty thousand voters for that happiness survey we talked about, uh, and a hundred dollars will reach three thousand voters. So just imagine one person, one NRI around the world can reach out to so many voters. Every person who knows about VBI, they can you know take part in one of those thousand projects. So their life improves, uh, and also it helps the country. It helps themselves. Just one person, you can reach out to thousands of uh, people in India. So. Uh, you don't wait, just uh, log on and, and help out. So we need your time, talent, and money. And uh, you know, so in the last election, very few people voted for the government, the UPA government. So the people who don't vote, they don't care. Now the government who comes to power is only selected by a few voters, like 15, 16 percent. So they don't seem to care, as the results show. Both sides are not caring. The country is in the state it is in today. If you look at Poland and Japan, they were really uh, so badly affected after World War II in the in 45, but now look at the country. You know the citizens work together and rebuild the country. So in India, we have a lot of good work going, but many people are like, you know, they have given up. They don't care. They don't see much hope. A lot of people complain. So if you do that, you've seen the result for the last 60 years. If you continue not doing anything and complaining for the next 10 years, it it may not be different. If you want to effect a change, we have to go and exercise our right to vote. 
and also engage in projects to help the country. So that way the country can improve. So this is the website 5 vote for a better India .in. There's also phone numbers you can call if you have questions about voting or you want to volunteer. And uh, for NRIs, uh, you can go and contribute your time, talent, and money. We greatly appreciate it at overseasvbi.org. All the events are also listed there. So be the change you wish to see in this world from Gandhiji. So let's all help with that. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dinesh. Uh, let me just uh, introduce Dinesh. N is an executive in the high-tech industry whose eclectic interests cover global history, strategy, geopolitics, geoeconomics, and a study of social engineering. He has authored many articles on these topics and participates in building social media forum on these topics. Uh, Dineshi, uh, thank you for taking the time to help educate the community here. Um, um, you can uh, please uh, go on with your presentation. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> Mahul, um, just give me one minute. So, Everybody can see my screen? Yes, can you do it? Uh, yes. OK, so uh, today's topic is RN Invasion Theory and uh, all the things associated with that, how it has impacted India before independence and after independence and uh, in general, uh, what it means to future of Indians. Um, so all our material is open source, available in the, uh, um, in the public domain internet and public library and everything. Uh, message boards uh, discuss all these topics uh, for uh, several uh, decades now. And then all these information are available in most of the places where experts uh, uh, who know about this subject talk about it. So you can always refer back to any of this uh, information back into, uh, back, back with the primary sources as well as uh, discussions and groups by uh, experts in this area. So uh, today we're going to talk about what RN innovation, what is RN innovation theory, why does AIT model still persist? AIT is the short form for uh, RN innovation theory. Why did this theory start first of all and who benefits from this? You know, why it has persisted for more than 100 years and what is the future of AIT and is there an alternative model? So all these things are um, questions which will come out of it come out and it has been asked before it's been going on for uh, several decades now so it's a good point now to discuss discuss the impact discuss uh, who benefits from this and then um, uh, what is the future how do we uh, go forward in the future for the next generation Indians because we need to at least come to a conclusion as well as uh, find a way forward so that uh, we have a correct perspective on our history so topic content is Aryan Invasion Theory, History of AIT, uh, European History, Sanskrit, Language, Concept of the Indo-European Languages, uh, Pre-Independence uh, 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 Information about this topic, Post-Independence uh, Discussion, and then European Control of Languages. So what is AIT? So AIT is a group of people from Central Asia who moved and built the foundation of Indian civilization. That is the foundation of this EIT theory. Based on the theory, people are divided into Indo-Aryans and non-Aryans as Dravidian ethnic groups. The Aryans brought in Sanskrit and associated literature, culture to the existing uncivilized society. This is the basic overall European construct of this Aryan Invasion theory. Okay, and there are various reasons how it developed uh, due to historical reasons during the British uh, colonization of India. During the process of colonization from 1700 to 1800 to 1850, 
they went through series of uh, uh, events where they conquered different parts of the country and also uh, penetrated inside India for administration of India. So at that time, they had uh, several reasons to adopt uh, different theories. And uh, with the knowledge of Sanskrit and uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the translation of the Vedas, uh, they were able to uh, construct something which uh, uh, from their viewpoint looks uh, correct. So uh, why did this theory emerge? So there is a political and historical reason for that. So 1700s, the Europeans saw the connection between Sanskrit and the modern European languages such, the, such as German and English. So in Europe, there are a lot of changes happening around 1600 uh, with the advent of the colonization and uh, uh, countries exploring the rest of the world. And uh, in, uh, in 1600, when William Jones uh, looked at Sanskrit, he figured out that there is a connection between um, uh, Sanskrit as well as uh, 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 European languages. Uh, Hebrew languages, um, Hebrew was the foundation of the European language at that time, which was considered as the uh, root uh, from which all other uh, languages evolved. The existing theory was to replace, to be replaced by Sanskrit. Sanskrit became a very critical language for the Europeans to adopt so that they could come up with an alternative theory uh, from their, um, from their uh, local history so that uh, they could claim uh, a different uh, uh, language route. So uh, in 1800s, they theorized that there's a common language called as Indo-European language. All the existing European languages now became Indo-European languages. And this being the common link to Sanskrit. So uh, they created a language group called Indo-European language and then they connected Sanskrit to it. Sanskrit is one branch of the Indo-European languages and the rest of the European languages are Indo-European languages. Having the ancient language, okay, they could claim ownership on it and then once they uh, took control of India between 1800 and 1850, uh, they could completely take over the uh, discussion as well as the dominance over the language, um, um, language discussion and they could claim ownership of the languages. So Sanskrit provided antiquity and also the root of the languages. So because of the historical nature of Sanskrit and its complexity, uh, they could um, uh, appropriate several features of Sanskrit uh, into the Indo-European um, groups, uh, language group, and claim antiquity as well as the root of languages. Uh, so the history was conjured based on connecting the languages. From the language, they 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 conjure, conjured the uh, they they uh, conjured the um, the history of the people groups who were uh, speaking this language, and then came up with the evolution or the migration of these uh, people across different areas in the European area, Central Asia area, and the uh, Indian subcontinent. So uh, this. This created an alternation of the mindset towards those within Europe to begin with. So Europeans got uh, uh, impacted quite heavily, and Indians, due to the colonization, uh, colonized mind, also adopted uh, this similar thought process. So there is a Eurocentric view uh, of this entire group of language on Indo-European language, which completely changed the mindset, and then it is still existing inside India. So we are in a junction, historical junction, where uh, uh, the world is changing in such a way that the uh, Western history, dominance of the Western history is receding, and the Asian history and the Asian uh, continent is expanding and uh, uh, becoming dominant again, uh, which was true 500 years back or even before that. So this is very critical uh, for Indians to understand this and understand the future, how it is going to evolve, so that uh, we really uh, know why from the past and correct our uh, uh, perspective correctly in the future. Uh, <clears throat> so Indian history, which is was existing before uh, the Europeans came to India, became a mythology. So Englishmen were taught when they first came in the uh, imperial uh, civil service, 
uh, officers were taught Telugu, Sanskrit, and Urdu. So the Urdu was a colloquial language. Sanskrit was the base uh, root of the Indian languages, and Telugu was a, a very important language because it connected, it linked the, all the South Indian languages. South Indian languages are much more uh, complex, and North Indian Urdu and Hindi uh, was uh, more prevalent, and they could manage across the entire Indian subcontinent, right from Afghanistan area and up to Burma area. So what happened was the English officers started understanding and gained the knowledge and also started practicing the Indian system way of thinking. So the East India Company wanted to control the Brahmanization of Englishmen. So they appointed two men to rewrite the history of India without stepping foot into the country uh, so that they don't get influenced by India. So uh, a history of India by James Mill and Charles Rand by 1813 okay, was uh, created and a mythal, a mythology was created out of the Indian history. So these books were introduced inside India. First, the, uh, the British officers were uh, thinking in that way. And then uh, the uh, English uh, educated Indians also started adopting the uh, same way. So what has happened is it created a, a cultural change and a, a social engineering of the uh, Indian uh, elite who started adopting the English uh, practices and thought process and languages and uh, education during the 1800s and the early 1900s. Uh, so when the Vedas were translated by Max Muller around the 1850s, 1860s, uh, India started believing the translated version of the Vedas, which was, adopt, it was translated for the European context as well as for explaining the European history, because the European uh, uh, language um, the discussion as well as uh, uh, adopting a, um, a language route was going on simultaneously and they needed uh, a, uh, a deep information about Sanskrit and Vedas was used as a way to get that uh, information. So Sanskrit became the language of the Indo-Aryan race, so they connected the races um, in Europe with the Indo-Aryan languages and Sanskrit being the root became the most prominent uh, language of the Indo-Aryan race and then in India they explained the uh, differences by showing that the Aryan race came to India and uh, imposed their culture on the Dravidians. So this theory kind of set the um, base uh, uh, foundation for the Aryan Indonesian theory and uh, uh, they could uh, extrapolate and uh, uh, kind of explain a very high level all the information uh, around India. And this prevailed for more than 100 years. Uh, so impact on India, the colonized mind was created as a result. So the colonized mind uh, before independence with the eruption of English uh, uh, worldview and a Eurocentric worldview uh, by the Indian elite created a um, uh, it created a class of Indians who were uh, removed from the roots and uh, they they started uh, adopting the English way in outside India but inside India. Uh, they started changing the practices um, of the government as well as a lot of uh, areas with the English way of uh, thinking. So this, this kind of put in a process for uh, 100 years of changes inside India, which is still continuing. We had discussed this in the East India Company topic. So uh, this deracinated uh, class of people, uh, deracinated Indians, are a key component of uh, understanding of how Indian changes are happening. And, and once we become aware of it, uh, basically this can be completely changed and we can adopt the uh, historical uh, Indian point of view such a way that uh, we can change the information. So after independence, we have come to a, a point where we can decolonize the Indian mind in such a way that we can adopt the right uh, perspective and also there is a concept of de-Englishizing our uh, Indian country where uh, 
English nomenclature and English point of view in the, from a language control and language thought process. Uh, we need to go, get back into the Indian language thought process. We can ex I will be explaining that a little bit more, uh, more later. So everything European and British were seen superior uh, by the by the uh, by the uh, 1900 English language, English manners, dress and music, pop culture, breaking away from Indian culture, seen as a positive modern outlook. This was a critical change which the British figured out, and they saw this as part of the social uh, engineering. And a lot of these were not on a uh, forced basis, just because English uh, adopt uh, English shows uh, were worldwide and English became uh, common worldwide as a language because of the globalization of the British economy uh, and the British Empire. The uh, elite Indians adopted these uh, customs thinking that these were the most successful customs. Segregation was created within Indian communities because of this um, a uh, the lot of theories. Colonized mind was the most lasting negative impact on the Indians. And uh, of course during the East Indian Company, the missionaries from Europe exploited the environment to propagate their own agenda and to divide and the rule India. So this is all colonial uh, imperialistic uh, process which Indians had to uh, suffer as well as uh, face a lot of uh, problems um, and a um, uh, lot of uh, sufferings which went on for uh, a few centuries. They created new terms within the Indian language, which kind of uh, created a false thought process and also falsified maps. So what is our innovation theory? Why that prevailed? And now we can figure out what is the problem with that and why it doesn't fit with our India at all. So the Vesas were incorrectly started at 2500 BC, uh, which from the European point of view was their logical point from where man can started. And then, uh, our Indian Valley civilization, which is already existing um, before uh, Europeans came in, which dates back to 5000 BC, we will go into it in detail later. So Habar, Harappan culture predates 2500 BC, Aryan Indian theory, Puranic Vedic culture, references to Saraswati River, and all the geographical references in the Vedas, and uh, uh, all the uh, flora and fauna, Everything corresponds to the uh, Indian subcontinent. So this iron innovation theory of uh, creating a uh, different uh, homeland of the uh, Aryans or the so-called uh, uh, invaders or the migrating people uh, became very apparent that it was uh, not uh, true. Only because the uh, elite Indians uh, adopted it and agreed with the uh, English it became a pretty solid uh, fact of uh, life and it continued for so many decades for almost a century. The origins of Indian horse genetic marker is different from the horses from Central Asia. So there are a lot of discussion and controversy going on even up till uh, the last few years and even this decade and uh, it will continue. But the po po point here is uh, uh, because of the science, development of science and genetic markers worldwide and genetic anthropology of humans and animals worldwide, uh, this information has been dissected and more scientific data has come in and it is able to disprove any of the old myths and uh, problems of all the old uh, history which has been prevalent before. So Indian horses different from Arabian horses and European horses. So uh, horse is only one part of it but uh, the Aryan theory talks about Aryans coming in horses and chariots and invading India. Basically, it uh, uh, it kind of uh, completely uh, takes it upside down. Uh, Sanskrit uh, basically is known as a uh, very antiquate uh, 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 language of antiquity and uh, roots of a lot of languages. There was commonality, but the commonality is more with the Indian languages than with any other languages. So there was a lot of attempt to connect with the Sanskrit and also a proto-Indo-European language was uh, created, uh, manufactured, and uh, they tried to create a, a historical perspective of uh, these languages. So let's go back to the Harappan uh, civilization. So, um, civilization, 4000 BC, these are the markers of settlements 
okay, of uh, um, habitation uh, during that time. So you can see the spread of uh, the um, the 4000 BC settlements with different uh, uh, areas and then 3700 BC we see more um, uh, settlement and then by 2500 BC there is a diffusion into the Gangetic Plains and what we see is the Saraswati River uh, kind of dried down around uh, this period and then we can see that the settlement in the uh, Saraswati River Basin uh, basically um, uh, reduces and it goes towards the Indo-Gangetic uh, uh, Plains and the Indus River continues to stay and the uh, Indus River uh, remnants are still there we can see it in Harappa and uh, Mohenjo-Daro areas but we can see the extent of this area this is more than uh, uh, a million square one million uh, square miles so this is a, a huge large area fertile area with multiple rivers and uh, this uh, uh, with the high um, um, uh, fertile area with the high uh, um, growth in farming and uh, settlement so this continued for uh, uh, several millennia in the in the history uh, in the antiquity so there is no doubt about it the question here is the about uh, who were in this area so uh, with the uh, carbon dating and uh, other scientific archaeological tools and analysis they have been able to uh, identify that the uh, people were here long before as well as the trans uh, translation of the scripts which we will show later uh, which they were able to decipher showed that it is uh, already connected with the uh, Indian Sanskrit and languages of India in, into the modern uh, Indian languages so if you see here uh, the timeline BC we see here that um, um, around 5000-7000 BC Sarsas is the, the tectonic changes in the Himalayas created all these the different uh, river valleys and uh, uh, plains and uh, agricultural um, 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 areas which were fertile and for human uh, farming and habitation and then by 3000-5000 uh, BC um, there was changes in the rivers Yamuna, Saraswati, Saraswati kind of started uh, declining and that also reduced the um, uh, habitation of that area uh, so uh, there was a change and that that might explain a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, gaps in the uh, area regarding uh, habitation and uh, what happened to the people around those area and then uh, by 1000-3000 BC there were uh, uh, desert land coming in on those areas around the Indus uh, River and we can see that in the current uh, in the present day uh, region you can see the desert in between uh, Indus River as well as Gangetic Plains with the Rajasthan the, uh, Desert under the Rajasthan Desert they found the riverbed of the Saraswati River with water still flowing there so you can see the geographical change which impacted the, um, the people's lives and the changes in the habitation and how they relocated and that also change, uh, explains the history of all the uh, areas around this uh, around this uh, people so in the future we have to conduct scientific analysis of the subcontinent and its history correct the textbooks within India revert outlook of Indian narrative by people of Indian origin worldwide and media the, and also make sure that the media supports the Indian history these are the things we need to take care of it in the future so that uh, our Eurocentric uh, uh, viewpoint of the Indian history within our Indian textbook needs to be uh, removed and put on a uh, India Indian point of view in terms of our history and our uh, 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 traditions as well as our civilization so there are several questions on Arvind innovation theory. Why does it still exist? Why don't the Indologist? So they created a couple of uh, uh, known as scientific branches. Indology is one branch, which is the study of uh, Indian um, uh, in Indian languages as to the Indian uh, history. 
then there is a philology which is a study of uh, languages uh, there is linguistic study of languages then there is uh, sociology language uh, study of the sociology then there is um, 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 uh, couple of a few more others uh, archaeology was not there during the uh, colonial period but archaeology kind of started during the exploration of the Indian subcontinent by the British so the archaeology survey of India which is uh, created during the East India Company they were photographing uh, Indian temples and uh, locations uh, throughout India which is which are now existing in Europe which are uh, um, which are now um, valued at millions of dollars uh, private collections in Europe of the uh, photographs which are of temples which do not exist now which has taken more than 100 years 200 years ago now uh, is being reclaimed uh, slowly so then we have uh, um, Indo-European language history all these things they are still exist what is the reason for having all these things so basically we can see that the Europeans need these deals okay they, they need for because the construction of the European history and the Western history and Western civilization is based on these language constructions which happened during the 1700, 1800 and the 1900. Um, they normalized all the languages of Europe towards a uh, grammar and a uh, foundation based on Sanskrit. So that is known as modernized languages of the Europe uh, which, which exists right now and uh, when they did the uh, when they did the computational analysis of uh, languages of Sanskrit, uh, they could uh, they could create a lot of models around this, and and European languages were adopted in such a way that they could uh, adopt this modernized uh, version of the language. So let us look at Indian civilization. So Indian civilization, we have stage one, 7000 BC. The stage two is 4000 BC. Stage three is uh, 3000 BC stage 4 is uh, 2000 BC so we can see the remnants of the um, archaeology sites archaeological sites around this Indus Valley civilization uh, and it's vast it's numerous so there is no question about uh, anybody doubting this okay and Saraswati you can see the Indus Valley and then the Saraswati Valley uh, Saraswati Valley right now it is under the desert of uh, Rajasthan so these sites basically completely uh, gives the full extent of the uh, civilization. Then uh, between 2500 to 2000 BC, there is a bloom on the, uh, there is a expansion and the prosperity of the Indus Valley civilization. And after 2000, we see a decline. And this explains uh, the uh, tectonic shift of the rivers as well as uh, change in the climatic conditions around that area and the human uh, habitation also more towards uh... um, Dinesh Ji, I'm not very clear about how uh, the river Saraswati has to do with the, the Aryan invasion theory can you clarify that? So uh, Saraswati river is uh, um, referred to numerously in the Vedic uh, text in the Vedas, Rig Veda and onwards so the Rig Vedic antiquity is established uh, but not according to the Max Muller's translation. It is much more before that. So the Saraswati River, references to Saraswati River, geographical references to all the geographical areas around Saraswati River are all coded inside the uh, Vedas. So if you do carbon dating of Saraswati uh, River and all the uh, habitation, archaeological sites around that area, you will know the dates of these um, uh, uh, of, of these areas so you can correlate to the antiquity of the Vedas okay as well as the antiquity of the Saraswati civilization so there is a correlation so if Sanskrit was used as a language to, uh, for this uh, uh, for this uh, Vedic knowledge then Sanskrit was uh, there even before that so there was definitely a continuity here okay let me show a video now I think that is uh, important to Resolution satellite images have 
verified descriptions in the Rig Veda of the descent of the ancient Saraswati River from its source in the Himalayas to the Arabian Sea. Pure in her course from the mountains to the ocean, alone of streams, Saraswati hath listened. The mighty Saraswati River and its civilization are referred to in the Rig Veda more than 50 times, proving that the drying up of the Saraswati River was subsequent to the origin of the Rig Veda, pushing the state of origin further back into antiquity, casting further doubt on the imaginary date for the so-called Aryan invasion. This satellite image clearly shows the Indus Saraswati River system extending from the Himalayas to the Arabian Sea. Here, the Indus River is on the left, outlined in blue, while the Saraswati River Basin is outlined in green. The black dots are the many archaeological sites or previous settlements along the banks of the now dry Saraswati River. The drying up of the Saraswati River around 1900 BCE is confirmed archaeologically. Following major tectonic movements or plate shifts in the Earth's crust, the primary cause of this drying up was due to the capture of the Saraswati River's main tributaries, the Sutlej and the Tristadvati by other rivers. Although early studies based on limited archaeological evidence produced contradictory conclusions, recent independent studies such as that of archaeologist James Schaffer in 1993, showed no evidence of a foreign invasion in the Indus Saraswati civilization and that a cultural continuity could be traced back for millennia. In other words, archaeology does not support the Aryan invasion theory. Marine archaeology has also been utilized in India off the coast of the ancient port city of Dwarka in Gujarat uncovering further evidence in support of statements in the Vedic scriptures. An entire submerged city at Dwarka, the ancient port city of Lord Krishna, with its massive fort walls, piers, wharves, and jetty, has been found in the ocean, as described in the Mahabharata and other Vedic literatures. This Sanskrit verse from the Moshala Parva of the Mahabharata describes the disappearance of the city of Dwarka into the sea. After all the people had set out, the ocean flooded Dwarka, which still teemed with wealth of every kind. Whatever portion of land was passed over, the ocean immediately flooded over with its waters. Dr. S. R. Rao, formerly of the Archaeological Survey of India, has pioneered marine archaeology in India. Marine archaeological findings seem to corroborate descriptions in the Mahabharata of Dwarka as a large, well-fortified, and prosperous port city, which was built on land reclaimed from the sea and later taken back by the sea. This lowering and raising of the sea level during these same time periods of the 15th and 16th centuries BCE is also documented in historical records of the country of Bahrain. Here is a glimpse of the massive Twerka city wall. Among the extensive underwater discoveries were a large door socket and a bastion from the fort wall. Two rock cut slipways of varying width extending from the beach to the intertidal zone a natural harbor, as well as a number of old and stone ship anchors were discovered, attesting to Dwarka being an ancient port city. The three-headed motif on this conch shell seal found in the Dwarka excavations corroborates the reference in the scripture Harivamsa that every citizen of Dwarka should carry a mudra or seal of this type. All these underwater excavations add further credibility to the validity of the historical statements found in the Vedic literatures. Apart from Dwarka, more than 35 sites in North India have yielded archaeological evidence 
and have been identified as ancient cities described in the Mahabharat. Copper utensils, iron, seals, gold, and silver ornaments, terracotta discs, and painted grayware pottery have all been found in these sites. Scientific dating of these artifacts, again, corresponds to the non-Aryan invasion model of Indian antiquity. Furthermore, the Matsya and Vayu Puranas describe great flooding which destroyed the capital city of Hastinapur, forcing its inhabitants to relocate in Koshambi. The soil of Hastinapur reveals proof of this flooding. Archaeological evidence of the new capital of Koshambi has recently been found, which has been dated to the time period just after this flood. Similarly, in Kurukshetra, the scene of the great Mahabharat war, iron arrows and spearheads have been excavated and dated by thermal luminescence to 2800 BCE, the approximate date of the war given within the Mahabharat itself. The Mahabharat also describes three cities given to the Pandavas, the heroes of the Mahabharat, after their exile. Paniprastha, Sonaprastha, and Indraprastha, which is Delhi's Puranakela. These sites have been identified and yielded pottery and antiquities, which show a cultural consistency and dating consistent for the Mahabharat period. Again, verifying statements recorded in the Vedic literatures. Although early Indologists in their missionary zeal widely vilified the Vedas as primitive mythology, many of the world's greatest thinkers admired the Vedas as great repositories of advanced knowledge and high thinking. Arthur Schopenhauer, the famed German philosopher and writer, wrote, that I encounter in the Vedas deep, original, lofty thoughts suffused with a high and holy seriousness. The well-known early American writer Ralph Waldo Emerson read the Vedas daily. Emerson wrote, I owed a magnificent day to the Bhagavad Gita. Henry David Thoreau said, in the morning, I bathe my intellect in the stupendous philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita, in comparison with which our modern world and its literature seems puny and trivial. So great were Emerson and Thoreau's appreciation of Vedantic literatures that they became known as the American Transcendentalists. Their writings contain many thoughts from Vedic philosophy. Other famous personalities who spoke of the greatness of the Vedas were Alfred North Whitehead, British mathematician, logician, and philosopher who stated that Vedanta is the most impressive metaphysics the human mind has conceived. Julius Robert Oppenheimer, the principal developer of the atomic bomb, stated that the Vedas are the greatest privilege of this century. During the explosion of the first atomic bomb, Oppenheimer quoted several Bhagavad Gita verses from the 11th chapter, such as, Death I am, cause of destruction of the worlds. When Oppenheimer was asked if this is the first nuclear explosion, he significantly replied, yes, in modern times implying that ancient nuclear explosions may have previously occurred. Lin Yutang, Chinese scholar and author, wrote, India was China's teacher in trigonometry, quadratic equations, grammar, phonetics, and so forth. Friend Dineshi, there is a question. Yes. Um, yeah. So there is a question which says, um, will the Saraswati ever come back? Okay, that's it? Yes, so, and there is another question, but we will come to that later. 
connected to Saraswati River, you can say that. You can. Okay, so Saraswati River is underground right now. So uh, parts of Saraswati River can be uh, revived back. They could create channels and irrigation system out of the riverbed under the uh, under the soil uh, in the desert area. It's possible, um, uh, but as a river with the geographical contours of a river like Ganga or Yamuna uh, or Brahmaputra cannot come back because uh, uh, because of the habitation as well as it will change the geography of the area around those uh, region and it cannot uh, come out like that. It will cause uh, uh, massive relocation or destruction if it comes out. May but because of earthquake or any other uh, shift because uh, of the Himalayas and Himalayas is crushing into the Asian landmass every day. Uh, it's supposed to be growing at one inch uh, every day. So anything could happen. There is a possibility in the next 100 years or next 500 years. So uh, we should be aware of this. But the point here is that these rivers have been there for more than 5,000, almost 10,000 years ago. So we have been here for 10,000 years for a long time. So there is no question of somebody telling us that uh, uh, our history from their viewpoint. So that is the basic premise of why should we look at somebody else's explanation of our own history and traditions and our own uh, timeline. That is the first thing we need to question. Second is uh, all the archaeology and all the uh, areas, settlements of our uh, uh, civilization are inside our area. We need to uh, do the research and do a scientific analysis of all of them and get them as our own history and uh, study them as part of our history uh, inside our textbook. And after that, we need to make sure that um, uh, our future generation gets the right perspective of uh, what Indus civilization is, uh, Saraswati Hindu civilization. I will go further and uh, discuss about uh, how all these things happen. So Indians are now worldwide, and uh, it's very important that all the Indians uh, who are worldwide know the correct history of India. Because of the uh, colonization, we have some breaks in terms of few generations uh, who did not get the right picture. So we need to get the right picture going forward. Uh, there is uh, other things around this RNA region which we need to discuss. There are certain uh, things which. Uh, uh, the reason why it still persists because it's being funded and uh, being promoted by a lot of uh, 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 groups, Western groups, because of the colonial uh, um, uh, uh, groups which are still there existing even after colonization. So uh, we need to be aware of that. There are a lot of religious reason for continuing with this RNA nation theory. We'll talk about it. Uh, but the main point here is uh, uh, it is needed by the Europeans to make sure that their Indo-European group, the framework of Indo-European framework still exists for them because that is the basis of the uh, European integration. But that was also the basis on which uh, European world, war, world wars happened before, during the rise of the Germany and uh, 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 during the rise of the uh, regimes in and around uh, Europe. So we need to be aware of that. So it is explains their history in the European history. So we should not be looking at um, their point of view. But from an Indian perspective, we should be very clear and understand that uh, uh, this is just a theory and it's not a fact. And we have our real facts about our civilization right here and that video which I showed uh, clearly explains archaeological hard facts. Archaeology facts are hard facts. So there is no doubt about it. And scientific analysis and carbon dating are hard facts. Any other facts, languages, okay, or um, uh, root of languages, or, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, a phonetic connection to another language in another region of the world, these are not hard facts. Uh, and uh, even uh, uh, any uh, conjecture are also not hard facts. Uh, so those are subject to a lot of uh, uh, controversy. So we should not look into that. So 
we can basically uh, at present with the latest uh, development in the last few decades with the scientific analysis of our area we can clearly say that uh, uh, our history is in our area and our Vedic uh, literature and Vedic uh, um, uh, Sanskrit are all connected to our land where we have been here for several millennia. Uh, so what happened in India is that it created a uh, social engineering and a sociology division within the Indian uh, people over the last hundred years. Uh, because of the Aryan, Indo-Aryans, Aryan race and Dravidian race, it created a division, artificial division. And Dravida is basically a uh, Dravida Nadu, it's a, just a region, it has nothing to do with the people or the races. And then Sans, uh, and Arya is a, Aryaputra in our Sanskrit literature is a uh, noble character. It's nothing to do with race, Jati or Varna. Uh, so Aryan is not an actual Indian word at all. So we should not be looking at that word at all. It's all artificial construct. So Western, so the English language created artificial construct of our uh, uh, our Indian sense of identity, and it created artificial divide. And this was exploited by the British. And even today, we have uh, Dravidian parties discussing about this uh, Dravidian uh, identity, which is uh, really false. Genetic uh, markers of genetic uh, of uh, genes of Indians, both all of all castes and uh, uh, communities have discovered that there's hardly much difference between them. Even the color of the skin is basically a, a small uh, uh, small uh, difference within the genetic markers. So basically all these things have been taken care of. But the things still persist. So that is the that is the work which the future generations have to work to make sure that all these colonial constructs are removed. This is called as uh, decolonizing. We are working through that system for the last 50 years now. We have reached tremendously in the last uh, few decades. Next is de-Englishization. So these Dravidian and Aryan languages are English language constructs explaining our uh, Indian identity. We need to remove that. De-Englishization is a big project. It will take some time, but uh, once it is done, it will definitely uh, help uh, Indians uh, uh, tremendously. So, uh, Dr. Jha, one of the famous uh, uh, linguists, uh, I would say a scientist, he deciphered the Indus Valley um, uh, language. Uh, as per AIT, Aryans invaded India in 1500 BC and drove out the Dravidian inhabitants of the Indus Valley. As per AIT, they therefore believed Indus Valley skill script to be a Dravidian origin. So there was this. Dineshi, uh, there's a quick question before we move on uh, to this slide, right? So you were talking about uh, uh, the English being removed. Uh, can you give exact clarity on what you mean by that? There's also a question that says, uh, will India go back to having Sanskrit as the first language? Um, so can you bring some clarity? Yeah, I will give a quick answer. Uh, but the detail answer I will keep it at the end. The reason is that there is a lot inside that. That's the purpose of this uh, uh, title of this topic. So uh, de-Englishization is removing the English translation of uh, Indian concepts. So dharma, there is no equivalent of English language. Okay, uh, religion is just a equivalent, but it religion doesn't really specify Sanatana dharma. Okay. Uh, Hinduism is also a construct of the West. Buddhism is a construct of the uh, English language. Uh, Aryan Dravidian, I have told why it is an English based uh, concept. So there are several examples like this. Of course, English ha English language has taken a lot of uh, words from root from Indian languages. Okay, Almost 10%, I would say, even they say around 15% of the Indian language, sorry, English language has been adopted from the Indian. Okay, Jagannath. It's a Jagannath temple. Okay, Jagannath is one of those uh, kind of words. There are so many examples. You can go into the internet and look at the Indian contribution to uh, English language because English language is an evolutionary language. It keeps picking up languages from every other area, uh, including even in the modern times. So uh, we need to we need to explain our Indian concept, our Indian heritage and our Indian religions using our Indian words. That's the key thing. The English translation, we started reading 
our history through the English words. So that that is known as um, um, there is a word for it. Okay, uh, let me recall and bring it back. So uh, we uh, it's a reflection of the English view of India. We started reading it, and then we started looking at uh, our own language and our own culture and traditions in the language of the English instead of in the language of Indian language. So that's why Indian language is very important to keep our thought process and our our traditions and dharma, everything together. Okay? Otherwise, what happens is uh, we will be Indian in uh, physical form, but English and Eurocentric in, in terms of mind. And that's why the clash is happening. So that's why there is a divide among uh, modernized Indians, so-called modernized Indians, uh, elite as well as uh, traditional Indians. So this artificial divide has to be removed. And that's the key uh, key reason for de-Englishizing India. Second is Sanskrit. Yes, there is a uh, uh, evolution which will happen because English came in uh, only in the last 200 years and it is a, uh, it is a, a retreating and the end of the Western historical dominance, history dominance is happening right now. So definitely within 100 years, there is a chance that the Sanskrit will become a dominant language in said India. And the Sanskrit derivatives, most of the Indian languages and Sanskrit derivatives will be dominant and Sanskrit will be there. So there is no difference between Sanskrit and uh, uh, other languages in, in that sense. So Sanskrit and then Prakrit also can come back and Brahmi scripts, all these things will come back as a language of uh, uh, describing the current world and uh, also language of study of our historical document plus we need to study the rest of the world using these languages not study the rest of the world using English so what we are reading in English of the uh, newspapers of the West and all we are looking at a viewpoint of their viewpoint not according to our viewpoint we still haven't developed a system of looking at the world through our viewpoint and our language there is a viewpoint of our language and which we need to combine so our cultural uh, identity is based on language and thought process based on our Indian languages and thought process and if we start adopting English we will disrupt this and then create a uh, deracinated rootless Indians in mind and that's very critical that we don't get into this path and that's a critical reason and this topic is chosen just to explain this okay uh, uh, the, la the 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 way we read another viewpoint and look at ourselves is a refractive it's called a, a refractive um, viewpoint and that we should avoid if you are aware of it then you will know really that that's not the right view, viewpoint so our literature our description about uh, rest of the world in our own mind and our own view and our, in our own languages is very critical okay going into the future and we need to generate both news media textbooks, research material, all based on this process. And we have discussed this in the other topics when we uh, did the other analysis. So let me go forward. So what uh, Jao figured out was Brahmi script is uh, connected to uh, Sanskrit and other languages. Uh, he found that uh, letters of ancient Indian scripts were related to the Indus Valley symbols Combining the many individual symbols, Jha deciphered word of uh, Sanskrit language uh, with the with the um, um, symbols written in 2500 BC. So this disconnect, which was used to show that uh, this uh, uh, Harappan civilization is not connected to our Sanskrit, was a key reason of propagation of the Aryan invasion theory. That has been now uh, completely uh, removed. So language and thought. Today the Indo-European worldview has a very clever and dangerous to reduce our choices to Indo-Aryan or Dravidian. This is what I was talking about. But this language control basically uh, removes our Indian thought process. Our Indian thought process is based on our Indian language. Indian language is actually not only just a language, it's language, it's also our culture and our viewpoint and uh, our identity. Okay. So it is very critical, even Tamil, Sanskrit, and all the other languages around us are basically connected 
to our thought process and uh, uh, identity. It's very important that uh, we maintain that. And we need to increase the literature, uh, non-English literature inside India. And that is a very big effort which will take a long time. So language is a means to understand and formulate ideas. Okay, But Indo-European construct which came during the colonial period for the Europeans okay, has seeped inside India. That we need to remove. Very critical. Once we delink it and then create our own historical framework of our own language and our own history, language history inside India, going back to Brahmi scripts and to Harappan and uh, Sarasati, then we complete our uh, historical uh, continuity. That thing is missing right now. That's a big hole, even after independence, and that's what we need to work on. Uh, we have absorbed the Indo-European framework and view, which is Eurocentric view of the world and our language and thought process. And that has to be remembered. See, my, right now, uh, we are doing our uh, hangout here in English, OK? To make, you, make sure that we get more people uh, understand and uh, able to uh, see this. But we need to convert all these hangouts and our lecture series into Indian languages. And that's a must. That is a key thing. So anything we do in English has to be done in Indian languages. And that we need volunteers for it. So when you vote and bring in the next uh, uh, government, definitely we can do all of this. So future of India is in your hands. So if you vote, you will have all, all these things. What I'm talking to you is what we have plans for the next 100 years. OK? So we need to be uh, ready with all this information. Understand the concept, understand the future and the vision, okay, and then implement it. Take action. The first action is voting, and that's very important to vote. So what is the deal with the cryptic uh, seal in the Harappan Valley civilization? So uh, all these things we have seen in textbook when we were in the school, okay? But you see that in the textbook, it was not explained properly, okay? At the time, they did not do. India, independent India also were not... Uh, doing research on the, all our ancient uh, 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 archaeological sites properly because they were still following the colonial practice of not using Indian text, Indian basis of our history and Indian language like Sanskrit. So when Rajaram and Dr. Jaha uh, deciphered it, they were able to connect. This is uh, the uh, Shiva, which is a common... Um, artifact found in the Harappan civilization, uh, meditation, Shiva. This is a bull of the Harappan civilization. And then this is uh, Ishta Devata. And then there is another bull. So prayer to the sun. So they have been able to figure out exactly connection with these symbols with our ancient language. So B.B. Lal is another, um, uh, he was the head of the Archaeological Society of India. He's the one who basically um, uh, excavated all the archaeological sites of all these um, areas of the Indus Valley Civilization and uh, came up with the right uh, uh, information. So then this is uh, uh, to explain the Indo-European languages and the construct. Now see Europe, then you see Indian subcontinent. How cleverly they have been able to connect European languages with the Indian languages. And this red color is only the Aryan languages. Rest of the other languages have to be the Dravidian languages. Then European language itself has a lot of construct. So all the disparate languages of Europe, they were able to connect. Latin and Greek is only one part of the branch. Then they were able to connect all of the other languages together into European language, Indo-European language. It was called Indo-Aryan language. And then they have a, a predecessor to that called a Proto-Indo-European. So this kind of manufactured construct, they think it's logical. But manufacturer kind of created a worldview for their uh, for their needs in Europe to unify the Europe and the Euro European history, but that created a big damage to India when Indians uh, adopted it. So we need to deal in this completely. So we need to create a uh, Indian completely Indian subcontinent language uh, family. And then create a history going back to our Indus Valley civilization. Okay, and that is a key thing which uh, which is yet to be done. So, so here, 
I think uh, there is also one basic fundamental question, right? I, I'm sure some of the younger generation might be thinking this. Uh, why does it even matter that history needs to be corrected? Why do we have to keep going back? It's not going back. If you don't know the history, you can't go into the future. That's a simple basic fact. So if you don't know your uh, history, you're rootless. If you're rootless, you really don't know where you're standing in the world. Luckily, India is such a deep culture. And India's valley civilization, our Sarasat is in the civilization is several thousand years. There's nothing to replace it. Okay, no other explanation can be. So we are, well, they say unique. Well, China is also unique. India is also unique. Every other civilization is also unique. But we exist as what we were 5,000 years ago. The same Rig Veda, which has been written in antiquity, is still being used. And we daily mantras are still being recited from that. So there is the continuity of our civilization. So long. We are not in a museum like in Egypt or in Iraq. And that is the thing. And that is why this history is important. Because we will never break this continuity. And yeah. if we ad adopt a false history, we will break our uh, continuity. And our new generation will start to explain, oh, okay, there were some ancient people in this area, uh, okay, who used to write in this script and these languages and recite this mantra. And they will keep it in a museum and show it to the rest of their uh, future generation. We don't want that. I think um, uh, if, if you uh, would allow me a couple of points, right, with regards to that, I would like to make is, um, Number one, if um, um, if we do not know Sanskrit, right? Say we are, we are taught in a different language other than our local languages. Immediately, what happens is that all the sciences, all the knowledge, everything, right? For for example, we have uh, ancient sciences that goes back to several fields: astronomy, astrology, medicine. Um, you know, you name it. There is a whole lot of information that is there that has already been figured out. So the moment we do not know the language, what happens is all the knowledge and the information that is already available, right, all of a sudden disappears instantly. We don't it's, not, it's not disappearance. We ignore it. No, from our viewpoint, it doesn't even exist for a person who does not know the language. But if you don't read the history, you will not know that. But exactly. if you read the history, so the bottom, you know what has happened back. Yeah. Right. So the bottom line assumption would automatically be that nothing like that exists. So whatever the, his language is telling him, that is what uh, he or she would understand. That, uh, I know, but that's not the world, uh, how the world works. Right. Because right. I'll refer back to their history. Right. I'm just bringing that into, the, into light, that you know, it is important to know the language in order to even know all the information that might already exist in that language. Correct. We all take, I, I take uh, language classes even now. We have to take languages to understand. And luckily, Indians are, uh, most of the Indians, I would say majority of the Indians, at least born in India, will know few languages, not one language. Few other languages, because of our national uh, uh, language policy, Hindi plus uh, other languages. So there is a uh, few languages. Some people are more, uh, um, you know, uh, adaptive, so they can learn, learn five languages. And if they work in different areas, they will learn. So this is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Okay, as long as you know what is the history of all these languages and make sure that we have the right context. That's the key point of this whole thing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and let me go back here. Do uh, uh, you want to take a break? Yeah, uh, no, Dineshi, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can finish it off, it's okay. Okay, so Let's look at uh, this whole chronology. This is very important to understand how these things happen. And you can see how uh, it, this could have been avoided if we knew this earlier at this point, and automatically we would not have gone into this kind of mess we have. So in India, this whole language thing has become a political issue, and even the Aryan innovation theory has become a political issue. So one uh, political group talks about our nation, the another political doesn't uh, oppose it, which is not really needed. This is all a colonial history and construct, manufactured history, which we need to completely avoid it. Okay. Let me come back to that later. So language control, using 
the new words they could construct different languages inside india and that's a key thing different con context and different uh, con uh, uh, concepts and uh, social groups and social identity okay and that is not good if the language comes from outside india and that is the thing we need to have control okay and that's the first thing we need to understand dalit is uh, not a indian uh, construct caste is also a foreign uh, construct foreign language jati and varna are our uh, concept indian concept not uh, caste okay same thing um, so indo european framework is for europeans not for indians so indo european language family we need to change it and we have to create a uh, uh, saraswati language family or uh, uh, indian language family we need to create that okay and that be on based on that our language policy and indian language policy needs to be constructed so uh, this framework okay if you look at it sanskrit kind of opened up europeans in the 1600s and they figured out that sanskrit has a connection to their languages sanskrit created a, has a historical context root antiquity and has a very uh, uh, codified uh, um, framework and this framework was adopted by them and uh, they reconstructed their languages in uh, europe so max muller who did not even uh, come to india was the person who translated vedas uh, and it was funded by the east india company and if you look at it um, his cons his uh, translations was for the english officers and for the european world but not for india but india has adapted it uh, to be closer to the europeans and this went on for a long time for almost uh, more than 100 years and that is where where we are right now uh, in india so uh, they europeans have been changing their uh, um, uh, words for this uh, language uh, framework it used to be called uh, indo aryan languages aryan languages they connected the race with the uh, languages and uh, connected their social groups uh, along with this indo european languages and uh, they created ideology based on this so they have used this for more than 100 years in different ways and uh, result is uh, where we are we can see it in europe right now so most of these are with caucasian ancestry which were uh, needed for them to explain their uh, uh, historical ancestry and uh, roots okay which they wanted to take it away either away from uh, uh, greeks or uh, uh, um, uh, rome uh, romans or from their um, um, hebrew or church based uh, history so they have their own reasons for doing that but india doesn't have to get inside that so indians can create our own historical concept and connect it to our uh, indus valley civilization going back to our roots and that is the key thing which is still not complete so indo european world view is very critical to understand because it, it connects the philology linguistics indology everything in one big bucket with sanskrit as their root language and they can own it and own the construct and own the future of this uh, construct uh, and if indians get into this um, uh, framework we will um, basically fall trap into all their inner problems so if we want to bring our cultural uh, context and a cultural view point and world view and our language based our own language based world view we need to delink it away from the indo european language framework and that is the main topic of this uh, today's talk so since the central thesis was that all indo european languages are rooted in proto indo european language and therefore european in origin all assumptions of uh, indo european framework will derive from this so the reality is current research in genetics archaeology and anthropology have shown that there was no invasion there is no migration and there is no influxion of aryans into india so uh, before i go to the conclusion let me go back to this uh, uh, flow because this is the main stages of uh, aryan invasion theory so around 1700 18th century 
India was regarded as the origin of uh, uh, civilization when they came as East India Company officials to India from starting from 1500 after Vasco de Gama. So when they uh, discovered this rich and ancient culture, you see that uh, around 1700, this just after Vijayanagar Empire uh, collapsed. So between 1500 and 1600, Vijayanagar Empire was very rich at that time. In the south and the north, there were many other uh, empires, including the Mughal Empire, which was very uh, rich. So Walter and other people figured out correctly that uh, India has the deep roots of the civilization. And then the late by late 1700, they found a kinship between Sanskrit and European language with biblical origins. So William Jones was the first one to connect, and he talked about Sanskrit as connected to the languages of the Europe. And then by early 1800s, 19th uh, century, ancestors of Sanskrit and Euro uh, European languages, they constructed the Indo-European uh, language family. And by uh, mid-19th century, it was the language of the Aryan race which invaded Europe and India from Central Asia. So Max Muller's theory after the uh, translation of Vedas. In India, the Aryans imposed their culture on the Dravidians, who had a separate family of languages. So Caldwell is the guy who said Tamil is separate from Sanskrit. And there is a Dravidian uh, identity, ideology. Okay? <clears throat> And that is the root of the Dravidian movement in India. And the Justice Party in 1920 was created out of this movement. So this whole uh, false concept created in 1850 is still lingering around in India. This is the first thing. This is called as decolonization of mind. And then de-Englishization of India is uh, this one. We remove this this or from past myth, uh, myth coming from the uh, uh, English uh, uh, East India Company as well as... Uh, colonial English narrative. These are all the narratives of the uh, English colonial uh, uh, imperialistic uh, uh, thought process. So these narratives, we need to be aware of it because it's all in the history. We are all talking about all this information being in the history. But we need to be aware of what is in the context and how it is still sitting, lingering inside our uh, language thought process. Look at all the headlines in the uh, newspapers, today's newspaper. You will see several of the information language constructs and how they describe things is based on the Indo-European framework and the English language framework. We need to remove that. Um, and then 1870, Indo-Europeans became Indo-Germans with blonde hair and blue eyes. And their original homeland shifted to Europe or even Germany. So this is directly related to the German race, uh, uh, German countries uh, rise in uh, 1870. By, in Bismarck, and uh, they had to create their own um, ideology. Okay, and uh, they naturally took what they have been studying for the last 100, 200 years, which is the Indo European, Indo Aryan uh, uh, f language family and the theory as well as the roots of their history. By 1920s, the discovery of the Indus Valley civilization and, 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 and the and assumption was that the Dravidians were sitting there came up in by 1920. This is a very clever interpretation. By 1920s, uh, they were about to leave India, uh, British. But we see that several of their um, people, officers, which are uh, there, they, they started coming up with, uh, it was discovered long before. Actually, in 1850, the uh, seals of uh, Indus Valley Civilization was there. They had to destroy several areas of the Indus Valley Civilization to put a railroad in the in that region, in the Punjab area around the Indus Valley. If you go back, you'll see that uh, around 1850. It is written in books, but it is not openly told about it. So India lost a lot of its uh, history because of uh, uh, British colonization when they destroyed a lot of land of areas. And even when they interpreted and uh, started studying our history, they studied it in their own worldview point of view. And, and that is essentially we are losing our own history because we adopted the English viewpoint of uh, history. Uh, <clears throat> and then what happened is after 1920s, scientific expansion and scientific advancement uh, created uh, knowledge, new knowledge and correct information about a lot of history. Archaeological history, carbon dating, uh, uh, and then... Um, 
there are different uh, you know astronomical as well as uh, other uh, uh, science which uh, allowed scientific analysis of past data including archaeology data uh, you got uh, um, soil samples waters water archaeology genetic archaeology genetic anthropology how the genes move from one region to other region and how the genes what is the father and mother of the genes going back to several thousand years hundred thousand years two hundred thousand years uh, all started coming out in the last uh, 50 years or uh, 60 years uh, because of the scientific advancement uh, the computers and uh, all the science atomic science and other science which developed in the last 70 years which we are all part of it so the modern world is established based on the science but we are not looking at our own history and archaeology based on the same science and that's where the disconnect is and somebody saying that we should not look at the history we need to rule look at the history because we got modern tools to look at the history okay and scientific genetic anthropology has shown that Indian genes uh, Indian genetic makeup with the highest gen uh, uh, diversity of genes uh, have been there for uh, more than 100,000 years uh, and then uh, this genes, uh, markers, uh, R12 genes has been in Europe. So we have a link with the European genes and European genes have come in after uh, our uh, Indian genes have come in. So definitely there is a uh, migration out of India into European area because of the uh, first humans which came out of Africa, moved to Middle East, come to India and then spread along the riverbeds and the ocean of uh, Southeast Asia and also moved to Europe. So this this is all uh, scientifically has been established and it is in the uh, Dawson's um, um, genetic uh, history which is there uh, in the internet. You can go and uh, research that. So uh, going forward definitely there is work to do. So let me conclude um, with the last slide of uh, uh, we need to ask questions that's one thing but we should not ask questions uh, for other countries or other foreign countries we should ask questions for India for Indians and for Indian history and for uh, Indian language families and our Indian Itihasa uh, Bharatiya Sabhyata and Bharatiya Sanskriti and not for uh, Eurocentric history. We should not be asking questions for Eurocentric history. That's the key question. That's the key thing to understand. And the conclusion is the linguistic model and the Indo-European framework which has been created. We, we need to understand why it is done and then keep it as a subject to understand but don't adopt it. Don't adopt it as our own. We have to create our own family that is called as the uh, Indian family, root family, Indian family. Sanskrit itself is the root of our languages. So definitely we need to build that. And it will take us 100 years. But when it comes in, we will see a completely different picture of India. Any questions we have? Yeah, Arvind had a question. Go ahead. Uh, Dineshji, I had one question about how history is uh, taught in India. Uh, and growing up, we all learned the Aryan invasion theory of like, how history was taught. They can increase your volume, Arvind. They cannot hear. Yeah, I'll get closer to the mic. Is this okay? Yeah. So I was saying that when we were kids, uh, Aryan invasion theory was taught as a fact in our history uh, in school. And I don't know if that has changed uh, in any way now. I believe that that could still be the truth, that uh, Aryan invasion theory is still being taught in our school. So are you aware of any systemat systematic uh, program or anything that is happening to change this in the schools? Yeah. Would you say that it's just one theory and maybe it has already been disproved scientifically? Good, good. So, uh, so this, ja you see here, I described a few of the scientists here. One is uh, Dr. Ja, okay. Here is Dr. Rajaraman, Rajaram. They are all there in India. You can go and talk to them also if you want. Then there is uh, Bibi Lal, he is archaeologist. Survey. So they are pioneers in the history of uh, India, archaeological history, uh, deciphering the language, language, um, 
uh, and also making sure that uh, uh, there is a connectivity between our um, archaeological sites, our Vedic literature, okay, and the language. So there are three basic foundation of our Indian history, which is in a very unique. It's not there in other countries. Archaeological sites, okay, Vedic literature, which is our ancient historical information. That, that they want to make sure that it is not part of our history. So that is the attempt by the colonial people and Indians have adopted it. So the debate in India is the two camps. One is adopting the Indo-European language family, Indo-European framework, and other one is which is rooted on India, Bharatiya framework. So I call it Indo-European framework and Bharatiya framework. So this is directly resulted result of the uh, British colonization. We need to remove that. This is an artificial divide. We can remove that. Once that happens, then there is no controversy. The controversy is created just by saying that it's controversial. There's no controversy. This is all research we have to do. There are a lot of unknowns. We have to admit there are a lot of unknowns. That's okay. That's okay because we are a big, oldest civilization. A lot of unknowns. So we have to understand it. But we let us do it in the right way instead of adopting a Western or Eurocentric concept. That's all. And, and, uh, and these uh, scholars have been doing the research, but it is not coming up in the uh, Indian textbook. So 80% of our history in India should be India-based. But what we see today is 80% of India is uh, Eurocentric based. And only 20% is India. So if you look at the chapters of India, so you see uh, Harappan and uh, uh, Indian history in the textbook. Harappan and Manjadaro is around 5%, 10%. Then we have uh, uh, ancient India up to 1000 uh, AD. Okay, uh, Maurya, Ashoka, Chandragupta, and all that, uh, Buddha and everything. Then we come to Mughal history, Islamic and Mughal history, which is a large, okay, almost 30, 40%. And then the British history, which is uh, almost another 40, 50%. And then modern India. So what we say is skewed up. If you look at uh, millennia, you have to put a time scale from uh, 5000 BC to 2000 BC. If you look at last 500 years, only it's a small part of the last 500, uh, 5000 years. 500 years is a la only a small part of it, one tenth. So uh, one tenth of the history should be having one tenth of the chapters. Okay? And 90% uh, should be what our India, true India is. So this is what the way it should be done. Our true Indian history is based on India's civilization. India's well, civilization services is in the civilization. So you see this scripts. So the, the three basic foundation of Indian history is archaeological sites, which is our physical location of our civilization. Our Vedic history, which is all our Vedic literature, because that is the root of our languages and where we come from. Okay? And then the last one is the language. The language is uh, Sanskrit and all the derivatives. The history and antiquity of Sanskrit has to be studied. So these three points are our historical heritage. And we need to make sure they are the foundation of our history teaching. Then automatically, all our viewpoints will be around that point. Yeah, uh, Dinesh ji, uh, you're right. So I, I guess what it proves to me and, and to us is that it proves that uh, once we remove uh, this theory, right, it clearly proves that Indian civilization, Indian civilization has been around for a very long time and it's probably the only civilization that's still alive today, right? Yeah, see, that that is a civilizational uh, discussion that's separate. When we talk about history, there are his, history consists of uh, hard history, which is sites like this, chr uh, chronological history on the location. Uh, of historical sites, that's one thing. Then history is based on history written during the times from those kings and monarchies during those times. So those are all literature history, which we need to have, have that, right? And then ancient civilization like India, we have very deep religious context also. So all those things are part of history. Vedic knowledge cannot be removed saying that this is uh, a religion came from some outside India. That's part of our history. So Veda has to be taught inside Indian history. Mm -hmm. okay? okay? Now it can be taught as a as a frame of reference, as an analytical model, or adopted as a 
Vedic science or Vedic uh, uh, language knowledge based system which we need to use as our thought process itself. That is the optimal, most optimal way we should do that. That has been lost because of the British and adopting the British school system. So before the British came in, we had Guru Sishya Sampradaya throughout India and school system was there being taught everything. They came in and changed and created a uh, European view model, European model of history. And that is how we got damaged. It's been 100 years and we continue to do that. 150 years, we can change it. Okay. Yeah, Parag had a question. Okay. Hello. So the, so the question is, um, were there any European Aryans or, or people of uh, the Aryan uh, kind of identity in some ways in the European um, ancestry? A good question. Good question. Okay. Uh, let me come back to that. I'll bring the slide on that. So, uh, look at this map, okay? This is only India. So, India is uh, uh, covered uh, with a uh, lot of uh, uh, geographical locations. One is Himalayas and one is uh, Central Asia through the uh, current day Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan and Central Asia, okay? So, so our connection to, uh, to the European landmass is uh, still a long way if you look at it clearly. But these ancient roots were there probably a few thousand years okay because Europeans uh, Jews were trading with India okay more than 2,000 years ago so this has been there so let's go back to the yes so here if you look at European history European history Greeks and Romans were there, uh, you know, at the time of the Buddha, you are talking about uh, 1000 BC, 2000 BC. Now, that civilization and all the inhabitants of other areas in Europe, now there is a connection to the European Eurasian landmass. So, Caucasian region is this area near the Caspian Sea. So, the, in a, the, um, domestication of horses and farmland were going on in large parts of Europe. So uh, there was definitely the uh, human habita habitation has started all this area probably 50,000 years ago or more. And there was a migration of uh, people which is recorded because of uh, several uh, you know, uh, things. One is uh, farm, farming land being uh, spreading towards Asia, towards Europe. Okay. Uh, languages the la and and different races inside Europe, Slavic race. So if you see, there is a uh, um, Slavic race, there is a uh, Germanic race, uh, Anglo-Saxon race. So there are several races. So they all they all had certain roots and certain uh, paths. What the Indo-European languages did was it kind of connected all of them together, and then created a homeland. For that language, from where all the people came in. So they consider this area, Urals, this is Eurasia area. Present day, uh, this is uh, Ukraine, you have Ukraine here, then you got uh, uh, Central Asia here. So all these areas were considered as uh, the origins of uh, the Proto Indo European. And from there, with the language, they constructed that these people migrated to the uh, regions with the current location of where these languages are existing. So ancestry-wise, from a genetic point of view, they say that there could be a, one common uh, uh, genetic uh, parent. But s recent scientific genetic uh, anthropology shows that I haven't put it here because uh, that's not the topic here, but if you uh, go to internet and search for genetic anthropology, you will see a lot of uh, links. The, the African uh, human being which came out to Middle East first. It had one branch to South Asia, 
and one branch to Europe. Okay, and then around 50,000 years ago, South Asians then came out like this and then moved to Europe as well as to uh, uh, Asia, East Asia, Mongolian area. So there were a lot of factors. The in habitation, if you look at it, most of those times were during the in the river valley, fertilized area. So one is Egyptian river valley. There is the uh, uh, Sumerian, Babylonian, Iraqi uh, river valley with the river Tigris and Euphrates. Then we have the Indus Valley river valley. So these river valleys are interconnected. So this trade is common here between these three. So the, the migration was easier here. This is this is a common area of link for at least from uh, 3000 5000 BC. Okay, current world of artificial state difference is a modern construct of the Western colonial system. Others, these links are always there. <coughs> we see that. Yeah, Dinesh, I have a question. If you are done. Yeah, now did it answer the question? So. The uh, European genetic uh, link is connected to migration from Africa to Middle East and Middle East and South Asia genes, all of them are there and they, they are constructed. So all the recessive genes, which is the white, white skin, blue blonde, are all the recessive genes of the world, actually. So they are not the dominant genes and they are all constructed because of natural selection in the, uh, in the <clears throat> winter region in this, where the sun rays are uh, more dark uh, days, they need they need uh, recognition eyes to see with low light, and this uh, uh, eyes with that kind of color actually is able to adapt and see the objects in the in the night time. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> so Dineshi, we have one uh, final question, and then we have to wrap up. Uh, so it is just surprising that uh, Indians are so intelligent because we learn multiple languages, right? While growing up, regional languages. I'm talking about the last 200 years, and then just a few uh, Europeans came and they they made us think something different. So I'm just surprised how this whole thing happened with a country that is supposed to be so intelligent. I mean, the the brain should be so developed because you've learned so many languages while growing up. So can you restate the question? There are two few parts to the question, so you need to state it correctly. <clears throat> yeah, so the question is that how come a few people from Europe came and spread such information which is not right to a country which uh, citizens are supposed to be quite intelligent? Yeah, that question has to be restated properly. Why did we adopt? Okay, so when British colonization created what is known as a political change. Let me go back to this uh, slide. <clears throat> Each in a company is critical to the Indian history. So what East India Company was able to do was change the geopolitical balance. So geopolitics, we talked about it. The geopolitical balance was large economy inside India with the trading uh, system going back to several centuries, millennia. What English, East India Company what did was it, re, it uh, stopped it or it reduced the Indian trade into and confined it inside India. And that's what we have it today also. And this is directly connected to why India is not connected with a lot of trading system in the world right now in this century, in this current decade, even now. Okay? Because the system what we have today is a system built by East India Company. I think we went through that in the East India Company topic. So that imbalance created a political mismatch. So Indian political system lost, it became weaker than the... So Princely states became smaller, weaker, and the wealth cre created by the East India Company was so dominant <clears throat> that Indian wealth and the Indian richest person became small, that they had to adopt the language and the customs of the Europeans 
to gain money and favors and other rights and system. That is how the English East India Company created a system where they could not destroy the people, but they created a restrictive uh, uh, rights around the people, around the small princely states and kingdoms, that they become uh, what is known as uh, uh, subsidiaries of the East India Company or the empires, and they had to adapt to gain favors. We uh, Indians have to adapt the Western or the European system to gain um, gain knowledge, gain access to other markets and other things. That's exactly what I'm talking about now. So India now, after independence, has come to a point where our Indian Indian uh, GDP and Indian uh, economy is so big now. In PPP terms, we are already third largest. That we are strong enough to uh, adopt our own terms and conditions for trading with the rest of the world. Can we do it? We need a strong political leadership, which will, which needs vote from everybody. But why didn't we do it till now? Because we continue to adapt the old system. So we have a system inside our system, even after independence. So we got independence, only partial independence. The political, there is a political language and economic independence which we still need to do. Once we do that, we will complete the cycle of independence. So when we say between 1800 and 1850, Indians lost politically as well as militarily and economically. So to gain access and to survive, India has adopted. All right, thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to the end of uh, this presentation uh, regarding the Aryan invasion history. Uh, this was a very, uh, <clears throat> I found this very profound, uh, Dinesh Ji. Thank you for taking the time to explain to us how the whole cloud has come of thought processes in the last 200, 300 years and now how uh, the certain experts in OBBI is helping to remove that cloud of thinking so then we can think fresh. Um, uh, talk a little bit about OBBI. So OBBI as we explained before is trying to address a lot of the election challenges. The the largest democratic elections in the world are going to start in a few weeks. Uh, so we have helped a lot with voter registration with lakhs of people around the country uh, registered now because of uh, this uh, uh, NGO and increasing voter awareness and voter participation. So we have created a lot of volunteers in different constituencies in India. We have door-to-door -door campaigns going on. And then we have a lot of products that we have launched. One of them is this mobile product that people registered. Uh, and this was very useful. We have this uh, thing that we worked with NASCOM partners to thousands of companies in India. They used us for registering this uh, portal, web-based system. It automatically fills in a lot of fields for you. We are doing this happiness survey as we talked earlier. For those who didn't uh, sign in earlier, so we are helping uh, people know what is the problem that they are seeing in the country, like you know, interacting with them one-on-one, -on -one, and are they going to vote, and can they volunteer for the country. So we want every citizen to spend a few hours a week in order to make India better. And the NRIs can uh, become a volunteer, enroll on the websites. They can start a chapter in their own country. You can call the friends and family in India to vote uh, or go yourself. And uh, we know about all these scams. Uh, and and uh, so we, we need to get rid of uh, these scams. And you can be uh, you can go on the overseas vbi.org. Uh, there are some nice inspirational videos. We have goals, goals to reach uh, you know, more people, do more fundraising. Your money is very important. Uh, you know, just your hundred dollars will reach three thousand voters, so they can vote. They can volunteer themselves for the country. It's better for the country. It's better for the citizen. So just one NRI sitting in any part of the world, if you donate some money, how much of uh, you know magnitude of reach you have through OBBI. And this is the contact information for I vote for a better India. Uh, there are volunteers to answer any questions on the phone or email. And here's the contact for the uh, overseas part of it. So we have this campaign that uh, we have NRIs which are flying to India. This is your chance to be on the ground level 
and uh, you know make an impact and you'll be uh, connected with this vote for india volunteers on ground so you can go to india and vote many people go towards the end of the year if you can adjust your schedules and go right now uh, that'll be it'll really help you you know the country so if you can make it that's great otherwise a lot of other projects uh, later on also but right now this will really help with this election so this is please help this fly to india campaign that we have set up for nris uh, you know, to involve themselves with the nation.